Well, there we go, ladies and gentlemen. You just saw two Europeans, young Europeans, getting on famously. Why can't all Europeans get along famously? Yeah, that's the question that we're going to be addressing right now because we're looking ahead to the forthcoming Vilnius summit and the ambition to create a wider Europe. A Europe, of course, including Ukraine. Very important decisions to be taken very soon. So let me introduce my panel to look ahead to the Vilnius summit and the vision of a wider Europe. Uh, first, I would like to introduce to you the Minister for Foreign Affairs from Poland, Radoslaw Sikorski. Welcome to you, Mr. Sikorski. We are blessed with two Ministers for Foreign Affairs because, of course, as all of you will already have twigged, we are very lucky to have amongst us today uh, Leonid Kajara, Minister for Foreign Affairs for Ukraine. And our third panelist is not a Minister for Foreign Affairs, but nonetheless is a hugely influential voice in foreign affairs in the European Union. A very familiar figure to many of you, I'm sure. Please welcome Elmar Brook, MEP, Chairman of the Committee on Foreign Affairs for the CDU in Germany. And... And he's also uh, a member of the uh, leaders group, uh, bureau group of the European People's Party uh, on Foreign Affairs. So, Elmar, welcome to you. I would like to begin our discussion by asking Minister Sikorsky to give us your opening thoughts on the run-up to Vilnius. I go up to the lectern. As long as you'd like to, that would be fantastic. Thanks, Stephen, ladies and gentlemen. Some of you um, may realize that the word Yalta rings pretty ominous in Poland. For years it stood alongside um, such expressions as Ribbentrop-Molotov and Katyn as a synonym of betrayal at, at best and dis dismemberment, dismemberment at, at worst. We know that 70 years ago, the big three met in this palace to discuss, discuss how to dissect and divide Europe. I'm very happy that um, I can participate again in a conference designed to integrate and to innovate Europe. 70 years ago, Pol Poland wasn't welcome. Today, uh, some of our politicians um, uh, play reading roles in uh, trying to make the right things happen. Uncle Joe must be turning in his grave. Somehow I don't pity him. <laughs> and I'm more than happy to be here and to um, help change that the word Yalta is associated in Poland, namely with this magnificent conference, this one happening on the cusp of important events which will decide the geopolitical orientation of tens of millions of Europeans for decades, perhaps for generations. We feel that Poland is in a position to talk about the new order uh, of Europe because we have managed to overcome the post-Yalta post division of Europe and the order and the fate that Poland suffered. Speaking of Poland's transformational success story, one is reminded of uh, the words of our great poet, the Nobel Prize winner, Czesław Miłosz, who said, the Poland of Solidarność seems to confirm that the most beautiful flowers sometimes bloom at the edge of the precipice. And I think this goes for Ukraine as well. The Polish transition experience has been, as far as we are concerned, a great success story, but we did what it took because we were facing the abyss in the uh, early 1990s, a state of free fall and a feeling of loss of control of our, our destiny. We were sick of being treated like objects of history and we wanted to do what it took to become subjects of international relations and to regain control of our destiny. 
So first things first, Poland believes that no one has the right to bully others into who they want to associate with and how. We oppose efforts aimed at exerting pressure on Kiev to slow down the process of signing your association agreement with the European Union. The decision to put pen to paper on an international agreement or treaty is a sovereign one and up to Ukraine to decide. Second, the Iron Curtain has long been lifted, but we must continue to eradicate existing, existing division lines on our continent and prevent new ones from surfacing. We cannot allow there to be a widening gap between an EU that develops innovative technologies and increases the mobility of its people and businesses and European neighbors who might lag behind. But one thing is for sure, fundamental values, including a fully-fledged democracy, respect for the rule of law, and human rights protection mechanisms, are indispensable elements for a modern state, a state that seeks growth and prosperity for its people. Third, the uh, summit in Vilnius of Eastern Partnership will be key to mapping the direction of uh, this region's ties with the EU. We would not only like to see the association agreements uh, signed and initialed at the summit, we also need to decide on a realistic vision of what to expect from the partnership in years to come. I hope that at Vilnius we'll have not just a technical document uh, detailing the progress of various countries, but a political vision of where we want our European unions to be vis-a-vis -vis the, uh, uh, the, the rest of Europe. And we need to um, map a uh, plan of ever closer political in and economic ties, further progress on visa liberalization, closer people-to-people -people contacts via student exchanges, scholarships, and more intense cooperation between civil societies, regions, and local stakeholders. Holders. Fourth, we see the summit as the beginning of a process, certainly not as the end. Uh, in the post-summit period, Eastern partners must move forward and make that de determination and, and show consistency in applying the reforms that we agree in these vast documents. As a co-founder of Eastern Partnership, Poland continues to offer strong expert support for the Eastern Partnership based on our experience. We are very well aware of the painful efforts behind each and every reform. We've done it all. And um, it wasn't nice or easy or cost-free at the beginning. That is precisely why we attach so much importance to the effective application of the more for more principle and enhanced support for reform leaders. And I'm glad that we've made budgets available to, to, for deeds and resources to go where our words are. Genuine engagement is needed on both sides. Poland will continue to back this principle and will work to keep the EU focused on our eastern neighbors. After all, given what's happening in the south, it's here in the east that Europe can have successes of its foreign and its neighborhood policy. And we should uh, play to our strength and um, take advantage of possible successes. Indeed, patience will be required when it comes to the necessary procedures on the EU side. Processing the uh, uh, association agreement's provisional application and preparing the agreements for signing with Georgia and Moldova will take some time. Nevertheless, Poland strongly supports the earliest possible finalization of these agreements. The full implementation of association agreements will then allow us to move ahead with the uh, European Union Eastern Partnership Common Economic Area.
as has been put forward during the second Eastern Partnership Summit and laid down in the Warsaw Declaration. Let me just finish by saying that we Poles know from experience that however overwhelming the next step may seem, getting closer to the EU will reap massive benefits in, in the future. Uh, between our association with the European Union and our membership in the European Union, in other words, without the, mem the benefits of membership, our exports rose two and a half times. You can do it too, provided you do what it takes to sign the agreement, you then implement it, you then fight corruption, you create the conditions for investment, and you become a modern European state. We've done it, so can you. You're on the last lap, and you have to have a good finish. And you know what I mean when, when, I, when I say it. It means um, further progress on the uh, laws that need to be passed, and further progress on uh, selective justice. You're very close. It would be a shame to be overtaken by events when you're so close to the finishing line. We've done it, so can you. I wish you well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister Sikorsky. And if I may, without further ado, let me invite two uh, the, the lectern, Minister Kujara, and give us your thoughts as you, as Radek says, uh, have gone through all the painful efforts to get to Vilnius. Give us your thoughts right now. Thank you. Uh, before uh, I will turn uh, into Ukrainian, I would, say, I would like to say some words. First of all, my congratulations to Mr. Viktor Pinchuk and organizers of this conference and today we have a strong reason for celebration. We are at the 10th annual Yalta meeting and uh, my personal feeling is as far as true and deep reforms will start after Ukraine signs the association agreement. So we'll have more opportunities to meet here to discuss what Ukraine uh, should do after the signature of that important agreement. It is my big, big pleasure to have uh, a good friend of mine and Polish, uh, Polish foreign minister, Radek Sikorski, with us here. And Poland, a strong supporter of Ukraine, uh, is a very bright example how the European Union and European integration can harm uh, an economy uh, of a country in transition. And uh, I think uh, many of you here are connected to the internet. And uh, if you look uh, at the CIA, uh, World Book of Facts and Figures of 1989, regarding uh, GDPs of different countries, you'll find that the Soviet Union was number two after US economy in 19. 89, and Ukraine produced 16.37% of the Soviet GDP, which made Ukraine within 10 strongest economies in the world. Of course, there might be some questions regarding uh, calculations and how to assess the Soviet GDP, but I refer to that specific book. Uh, and in 1989, Polish economy was times smaller than the Ukrainian economy. What we have today? Today, Polish economy is two and a half times stronger than the economy of this beautiful country. What does it mean? So it means that a harmful European integration led Poland to economic, social, political success. And Ukraine today is still producing 70% of the GDP Soviet Ukraine produced many years ago. So our decision is very much strong on the European integration. And for me, today it's quite easy to talk. Why? Because uh, we all listen to the statements by 
President Yanukovych and Prime Minister Azarov. And I think today uh, we all have no doubts that the Ukraine's decision is a deliberate one, an independent one, and a very strong one. So, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 10th annual Yalta Conference, and I hope to see many of you in the coming years. Uh, I will switch to Ukrainian because I have an official statement written. I, had, I have to pronounce. Uh, Dear ladies and gentlemen, for the third day today, we're talking about the importance of the signing of the session association agreement for Ukraine. And the topic of uh, our today's panel is self-eloquent. We're all of us waiting for the summit in Vilnius. The world around Ukraine today is as if it's a standstill waiting for what's going to happen very soon by the end of uh, November this year. Maybe someone does not even bear to uh, wait in this uh, tension and uh, they panic because of the reasons that are beyond our reason. Someone is uh, in the state of euphoria. We also can see this. There's an impression that within uh, three months for Ukraine, there will be the end of the world or we'll find the panacea from all of our problems. I'd like to assure you that neither of these things will happen. I do not uh, decrease the significance of the summit of Eastern Partnership and the decisions that will be adopted during this summit. On the contrary, myself, I uh, impatiently am waiting for this. And for me, as a Minister of Foreign Affairs of Ukraine, will be it will be a great honor that the association agreement between Ukraine and the European Union will be signed while I am the Minister for Foreign Affairs. However, my personal feelings are just a small part of aspirations of 46 million of Ukrainians. I also want to emphasize that a logical completion of one of the stages of our Euro integration way is going to happen. The stage that will launch the process of political association and economic integration with the biggest market in the world. However, this is not the end of the road. And the Vilnius decision that we are waiting for is the expected decision in Vilnius is not something unexpected. This is the result of a prolonged and assiduous work of many governments of Ukraine. It is very, I am very pleased that the government that I represent will be part of this historical fact. This is also the fruit of uh, joint efforts from our partners from European Union, the fruit that we will enjoy and get advantages from it, and both sides will be able to do this. No doubt the interest of Ukraine in the signing of the association agreement is predominant. At least we will get the first real embodiment of our strategic wish aspirations declared almost 20 years ago. And we will gain the expected result of steps and reforms that were effected during this whole entire period. I can assuredly say that Ukraine became an example of realization of the program of Eastern Partnership one of the authors of which is present here today, <coughs> Mr. Minister Radek Sikorsky. To my mind, even today we can talk about the specific successes in the realization of this program in spite of uh, any results that may happen during the summit in Vilnius. It is equally pleasant to me to inform you that 
on the 18th of September, the Ukrainian Cabinet of Ministers approved the association agreement, and I hope very much that soon the European Union will do the same. As a result, by the summit of the summit of Ukraine EU in February this year, we have defined together the key aspects in the sphere of improvement of our legal system and the judicial system. Their realization is happening in the clear-cut cooperation with European institutions, Lithuanian Presidency, and other partners in EU. The guarantee of Ukraine's success in this way is the positive attitude in our society to the most recommendations of EU because they do correspond with the aspirations and expectations that are present in within the Ukrainian people. To, now, the active work on realization of some clauses of the association agreement now, even before it is signed, will allow us to increase the dynamics of positive transformations in the process of its implementation. That's why the Ukrainian side is interested in the broadest possible provisional application of the association agreement right after its signing and ratification by the, our parliament and the European parliament. This opportunity does strengthen the added value of the agreement and does not make it a hostage of uh, prolonged procedures. We also expect that uh, the, our success, progress in the realization of the plan for actions in the liberalization of visa regime will be uh, stated during the Vilnius summit. Recently, the so-called strengthened agreement between Ukraine and EU came into force about the simplification of visa issuance to citizens, to journalists, professional organization members, religious communities members, and Etc. This means that another step has been made in order for Ukrainians to freely travel around Europe. I'd like to remind you that for Ukraine, the association agreement is, first of all, the chance to realize the clear-cut program of all-embracing reform of uh, social institutions and leading branches of economy with the aim of political and economical growth of Ukraine as a uh, independent contemporary state. The key element of the association must uh, start to work when the document is uh, adopted, the free zone uh, agreement between Ukraine and EU. This type of agreement is uh, for the first time concluded between the European Union and, and a third army country. Its uh, key novelty is the spread of the regime of free trade to the service sector and the liberalization of the movement of workforce in particular, and also the wide program of adaptation of economic and sectoral legislation of Ukraine to norms and standards of the EU. This will, this should allow to remove non-tariff barriers for Ukrainian export to the internal market of EU. We also paid attention to such delicate branches of Ukrainian economy as agriculture and car industry. Uh, the, we have to provide for the transition period indeed. The reality of today are the process of uh, world globalization and large-scale liberalization of trade which in particular happens under the leadership of the US and EU and not the creation of new delineations and artificial trade and economic barriers. On the other hand, Ukraine, together with the countries, other countries of Eastern Partnership, can become a uniting link 
for the functioning of a large-scale Eurasian zone of free trade. This means the implementation of the project from Lisbon to Vladivostok. Dear ladies and gentlemen, today we are oriented to step-by-step -step process of integration. I'd like to emphasize that along this way, Ukraine is not only a beneficiary, but also a contributor to the process of creation of a safer and wealthier Europe. Because Ukraine is the huge market and also highly qualified workforce. We are a enormous transportation system at the crossroads of uh, east and west and north and south. One, just one fact, three of uh, ten European transport corridors are running through the territory of our country. We have also confirmed that we are a responsible member of energy community, and we are planning within the framework of our presidency in this organization next year to contribute a great attention to energy challenges. Ukraine has up-to-date technologies and a great experience in high-tech branches. We are one of the richest in natural resources states in Europe. And uh, last, our country is a uh, important factor of provision of peace and stability in European region. I'd like to emphasize that the association agreement today is an optimum instrument both for Ukraine and the European Union. It will define the legal basis for further progress of our bilateral relations for medium term and regulate the direction of interaction at the transition stage. At the same time, the association is an opportunity for EU to again prove the force of its transformation power and attractiveness to continue the further realization of the idea of European unity and to spread the experience gained with Ukraine to the rest of the countries of Eastern Partnership. I was pleasantly impressed by the recent article of the EU representative in Ukraine, Mr. Jan Tombinsky, together we are stronger. In view of his uh, authority, he, as probably no one, uh, no other European official, has quite closely seen those positive movements that are taking place in Ukraine, those efforts that our state is applying for the positive decision in Vilnius. To my mind, the title of this article allows us to clearly express the essence of relations between Ukraine and European Union. Together we are stronger. Uh, this should be understood by those who probably still doubt the reality of the Vilnius stepped forward. And of course this would not be... Uh, we should also think about making this statement a slogan for the summit of Eastern Partnership. Well, of, of course, the document is 2,000 count numbers, 2,000 pages in Ukrainian, probably in, in more in some other languages. I am uh, really glad to speak at this discussion today. I am even more happy. I am even happier that my friends, Mr. Sikorsky and Mr. Kro Brock, are here, who will help us to understand uh, the key issue, what's going to happen to Ukraine after the signing of the agreement. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Elmar Brock, I want to get your thoughts on the uh, run-up to Vilnius now. We've heard from two ministers who are in absolutely no doubt, first, that the association agreement is vitally important and that it will happen. We didn't go into much detail about why it might not happen, and I want you, as an arch-experienced political operator, who knows Brussels very well, to give your assessment, both of whether it's seen that way in Brussels as an absolutely positive thing, and 
perhaps more importantly, whether you really believe the signature is going to happen in late November to get this deal done. Elmer, if you want, you can sit down because I want to make this as quick a debate as Equal we can have. Treatment it. of Parliament. <laughs> <laughs> Let's say me a few uh, words. Thank you very much. Thank you, ministers, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I would like to thank uh, the organizers. I had a feeling that these days were helpful to understand each other, clarify motives and chances, and uh, therefore I have seen this as a successful conference. Secondly. The European Union is not just a free trade area. That's also there was a discussion before. There were certain misunderstandings. It's not a state, but close to a federal state. It's the type of legislation with its own legally binding charter of fundamental rights and all of that. And therefore, on the way to that, such conditions as the treaty says must step by step be fulfilled. And uh, I believe that is done the European Union has to fulfill its possibilities, but also an applicant country in every step, in this case, association agreement. And I hope I have understood, misunderstood my former chancellor. Ukraini, Ukraine should not have an association agreement and a closer relationship to the European Union as a follow-up of our relationship with Russia. It's Ukrainian sovereign decision to do that. And. Uh, that whether the signature is done in Vilnius or not has not to be cited in Brussels and not in Moscow. It has to be cited in Tbilisi, Chisiano, and Kiev. And that must be very clear. And I think that this association agreement and a closer European perspective for countries like Ukraine is very important. Vitaly Klitschko told me yesterday when he traveled 20 year, um, years ago from West Ukraine to Eastern Poland, it was nearly similar. And today he sees the incredible progress Poland has done. And that is one of the advantages of closer to Europe, which can be seen and felt by the citizens directly. I think on this way, for the preparation for the Vilnius summit, we came very far now. And uh, what I hear from the Venice Commission, and they will report to us on Tuesday in my committee, it looks so that the question of judicial reform, electoral law, office of the general prosecutor, which is one of the most important questions in this context, is going in the right direction. And uh, there will be some elements, but I hope that can be taken on board. And there will be a broad majority in the RADA to implement that. In con mostly in consensus before the Vilnius summit. All this, what is was said as uh, requirements in the decision of the foreign ministers in December, were already said both before initially. Then we said, okay, it's not fulfilled, let's do it before signature. Now it's time to do it before, before signature. And here I think it's one question still what Mrs. Gibaskaite and Radek Sikorsky mentioned also as selective justice and the Timoshenko case. It's part of it. And I can say also in the name of the President of the European Parliament, he asked me to do so. If Cox Kwasniewski cannot give a positive report to the European Parliament on the 15th of October, then we have a problem. And Karl Bildt has said that yesterday, then there will be also a problem in the Council. And I think it should be possible, and I hope after what the President yesterday said, that there's no decision taken until now, that we come to a possibility that purely on humanitarian basis, here a solution is possible, which make it possible to sign the Vilnius, uh, uh, on sign on the Vilnius summit. I believe this Vilnius summit is of the utmost importance. It has, we have to see our geostrategic interest in that, but it is interest, as Radek Sikorsky said, on the basis of all our values. And I think we are on a way to achieve that, and I hope that we are not in a marathon race, where we are 100 meters before the final line and then fail. Well, I hope that we do all that important step to achieve that and make it possible in Vilnius. Elmer, thank you very much indeed. And because we're quite short of time, because we're quite short of time, I'm going to just put that immediately, if I may, 
to you, Foreign Minister, to respond. I think what we've heard from both Elmar and perhaps in more guarded language from Radek Sikorsky is that there are certain things that have to happen before November, and we all know what we're talking about. And uh, I just wonder whether I can invite you to tell us whether the Timoshenko case and the actions that have been required from you by the European Union will be taken by November. Can you overcome this obstacle? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Brock. And uh, I think in this audience, there is no a person who uh, understands what is the prime reason that Ukraine signs the association agreement. I'm not in a position to comment uh, the statement by the president Yanukovych made uh, here yesterday. So uh, that's why uh, my response would be, Mr. Brock, you are right and you are wrong, saying that uh, EU is not only FTA. For Ukraine, European Union, this is association agreement right now, which consists of two parts. One is a political part, political statement, a program of reforms for Ukraine, and the bigger part is FTA. And uh, we all understand also that Ukraine doesn't put a question on membership. And here we have uh, a Polish foreign, a Polish foreign minister, if I, I would ask him directly if Ukraine applies for the membership, but I don't want to do that. So the answer will be not now, and we don't know when. So if we are talking on relationship between Ukraine and the EU, so let's understand that's not about membership of Ukraine, that's about political, economic, social reforms in Ukraine, and free trade. So, All this right. would be my answer. Thank you. Uh, yes, well, I'm not going to push it right now, although I'll get you on hard talk and then I'll push it. But uh, <laughs> for, for, for now, I want to open it up to our audience because uh, Minister Sikorsky has to, unfortunately, has to leave at about five minutes past one, so we must wrap by then, and I want to give you the opportunity for some questions. So you've got your hand up. Uh, let Wait for the microphone and ask us your question. Keep them as brief as you can because we want to get through as much as we can. Is the mic working? Um, I wonder if we have another microphone we can get over there. Or you could just speak very loudly. How loud is your voice? Uh, of course, yeah. We, we actually need the microphone so the translation can work, so. Okay, here we go. Bucket Brigade. All right, here we, go. Here we are. Um, Ruben Johnson from the Weekly Standard, very quickly. There was a report that came out about 10 days or so before this conference, produced by a Washington think tank. It's about 88 pages long. Anybody wants a copy, I'll send it to you. Just give me your business card. It documents in rather extreme detail that uh, Russian companies linked to this club of former KGB officers that part of Putin's inner circle are shipping arms out of the port of Oktyabrsk surreptitiously using ships that are linked to people around Putin. It's Russia doing what they always do, which is trying to do their dirty business in Ukraine so that they don't get tagged with it. Now, that has to stop. Hey, let's have the question, because we are really yeah. short of time. Well, that has to stop. How is it going to stop? Because there's too many people making too much money. If Ukraine's going to become part of the, an EU associate, how do you stop that? And what's going to be done about it? Hello? Can you hear me? So, uh, your question is an extremely important one. And I'm very happy to see your face and uh, to know who is the author. You mentioned KGB-led companies in Russia. Are you part of that? Why? Because I am absolutely convinced and uh, Foreign Ministry officially published a statement on our website that there were no shipments since 2011 of any specific... Uh, commodities, uh, military-related goods to Syria. And Ukraine fully complies with the sanctions against this country. And what is said uh, in the very res well-respected newspaper is a, 
a complete lie. Thank you. All right. I, I just, because the Timoshenko issue is an important one, I just have a feeling that Minister Sikorsky has a very brief comment on it, and then we're going to get to at least one more question. But go on, Radek. I think you wanted to say something about the Timoshenko case. Oh, here in Ukraine. So can you hear me? Yes. Um, <clears throat> as um, Leonid was saying, um, you were once part of the Soviet Union. Poland was part of the Soviet bloc. We were all taught the basics of Marxism. And um, they were that history is made by impersonal forces driven by technology, ownership, and stuff like that. But we now know that it's not true, that history is also made by individual people. And I believe in, its, in the mutual interest of Ukraine and of the EU to sign this association agreement. But I would appeal to you not to underestimate the role of um, individual people, individual politicians in history. Because on the Yulia case, uh, undertakings have been made, promises have been made. And it's a question of trust. And when Elmar Brock, who is known to be close to Chancellor Merkel, who is likely to be Chancellor for the third term, tells you um, that Yulia case is important, that means that the Chancellor of Germany thinks it's important. There are other uh, important politicians in Europe, and you need the agreement of all of them. Um, in the end, it's a test of trust, and also a test of the quality of your leadership. I will tell you frankly that sometimes people suspect that politicians in, in our part of the world don't do what's in the interest of their countries, but do what is in their own political interest, which is actually something that happens to politicians all over the world. Well, this is the case, the risk of miscalculating um, the impact of the Timoshenko case on Europe's decision is just f too big for you to take. So we need both your president and Mrs. Timoshenko in the next, both of them, your president and Mrs. Timoshenko, to do what's right in the next few days. Well... Yeah, brief, briefly, briefly, if you would, Foreign Minister, brief response. Thank you, uh, Radek, and uh, I value very much your in, uh, investment, not only in our affairs with the European Union, but also at this conference. So, but what I said means that President of Ukraine devoted his valuable time to respond to this very important question. And uh, I am, as a Foreign Minister, simply cannot comment and have no rights to comment his statement. Well, Thank you. well, we'll get one more question in, and then we have to wrap for lunch, I'm afraid. But, sir, you've got the microphone, but it's got to be quick. Yep. Thank you. Our Mother Chow Razenkov Center, Ukraine. Now, just we discuss about Wellness, I want to ask you about interest, geopolitical interest. Mr. Brock mentioned that uh, association agreement not only about free trade area, I agree with you. But my question to Mr. Sikorsky, as a former defense minister, I don't expect any changes and put your expectation on stability and security after signing this agreement in the continent. Do you see this like an uh, additional instrument to increase the stability? And European Union ready to support Ukraine of any attempts to push Ukraine uh, on instability in some situation? Thank you. Brief as you can, Radek, and then... Well, I'm willing to make my personal contribution to the, uh, the stability of Ukrainian economy, and I undertake to eat more Ukrainian chocolates. <laughs> um, but look, um, Poland's relations with Russia are now better now that we are members of the EU and NATO than they were before, when the question was open. When the question is open, people feel uh, entitled to exert pressure. Once the question is settled, they have to live with, uh, with the sovereign decision of a free country. Um, Ukraine will still be a, a, a very important uh, partner for Russia. Uh, I understand you're um, 
sometimes the first, sometimes the second uh, economic partner for Russia. You're now number three. Um, I, I hope uh, reason prevails. Um, n nobody benefits from these um, politically motivated boycotts or trade wars. Uh, and uh, I hope in due course, if Ukraine makes the modernizing effort, quite frankly, I hope Russia will be next. That Russia will uh, do what Prime Minister Putin, in his first time as Prime Minister, sketched out for his country, a, a bold program of modernizing Russia rather than a, a return to some kind of 19th century uh, mode of, of operating towards um, neighbors. I think it would be good for the Russian people, but also in the long run, in the long run for the Russian state. That, that, that was some time ago, unfortunately. <laughs> but, uh, 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 Elmar, last, you've promised this is going to be a very, very short comment because then we're going to have to wrap, but go on. Thank you very much uh, because of the geostrategic questions. We are totally aware for that. I would like to inform you, because we are aware for that, that I have called for Tuesday the first meeting to prepare the legislative instruments for the provisional implementation of the situation in, Green, in the European Parliament. And we have a decision of all 28 national parliaments of the European Parliament to be helpful in this IMF question, IMF question and others. Because we see that in a, in a context, but always is behind these sentences if the requirements are fulfilled. And so therefore, you show, see our goodwill to be helpful, especially very fast after signature. Well, thank you, Elmar. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been fascinating. I feel we've almost had real-time negotiation up here on the stage, which is going to get very germane as we move toward uh, Vilnius and, and the end of November. It's been really, really interesting for me to listen to you three. May I just thank you, all of you, so much for coming up on this panel. Thank you all for listening. And ladies and gentlemen, it is time for lunch, so thank you very much.